It's Thursday, January the 6th, and welcome back to Goodfellows, a Hoover Institution broadcast examining social, economic, political, and geopolitical issues. I'm Bill Whalen. I'm a Hoover Distinguished Policy Fellow, and I will be your moderator today. I'd like to wish you all a belated Happy New Year, and that applies to my colleagues who you see before you, the three of my colleagues who we jokingly refer to as the Goodfellows. That would include the historian Neil Ferguson, the economist John Cochran, and the geostrategist slash hopeless optimist, Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster, Hoover Institution Senior Fellows. All gentlemen, a happy new year to you. I hope your 2022s are off to a good start so far. And we're going to do something a little different to start off the new year. We turned over the show to our viewers. We asked them a few days ago to send in questions. And as per usual, they did not disappoint. Our producer, Scott Immigrant, and I went through the mailbag uh, the other day. We came up with questions from no less than viewers in 24 states across America, 20 states across, uh, 20 nations, excuse me, across the globe and three continents. Uh, we have now received questions from six of the seven continents. Uh, Neil, if you know anybody in Antarctica, please get them to write to us so we can close the loop on that. So if the three of you are ready to play, let's get right to it. And here's a question to all three of you. It comes from Ed in the UK. He writes, quote, in reference to how civil wars start by Barbara F. Walter, is the U.S. heading towards endemic violence and civil disorder? And what can be done to prevent that? Is 1970s Northern Ireland a possible outcome? I don't think it is. And the reason I don't think it is, uh, is that it's really hard to have anything resembling a civil war unless the military divides. That's certainly the lesson of the uh, U.S. civil war. I also don't think it's appropriate to, to think of uh, the situation in Northern Ireland in the 1970s. I mean, there you had a profound religious division between Catholics and Protestants that stretched back to the Reformation, where uh, you would see the date 1690 painted on bus shelters. Uh, the United States is not divided in that way today. Oh, it's divided all right, but it's divided in a kind of fractal way you can find the same divisions at the national level, but then you zoom in and you find them at the state level, and then you zoom in and you find them at the county level, and then you zoom in and you find them within families. The divisions within the US therefore don't lend themselves to anything remotely resembling uh, a civil war as I understand the term. And I think there's a great deal of hyperventilation on this subject uh, within the commentariat, the class of people who get paid to write alarmist articles. John, this question comes to you on the one year anniversary of the riots at the Capitol. Yeah, um, I, I agree with Neil. Uh, you don't have a true civil war with the size military we have unless the military uh, fractures. And, and we are now I worry we're on a slippery slope, but, you know, we're, we're five steps down the slope, but we got 10 steps to go, uh, especially regarding accepting the finality of elections and peaceful transfer of power. Uh, I think uh, also to, to have a civil war, you need geographic um, the polarization and a good th thing of the electoral college is it tries to force uh, some, it forces politics not to be geographically extreme. But I do think the other steps on the way, uh, we have, our, our cities are getting more and more violent. We are having larger number of unpoliced zones. Uh, riots are, are breaking out over political events. Uh, that's not a civil war, but that's an unpleasant state of affairs uh, that, you know, 20 years down the road might lead to civil wars. Can I qualify that, John? I think it's an important point. We did have uh, a significant uh, outbreak of, of political unrest in 2020, but then it morphed into a crime wave that really didn't have a political character. Most of the problems that we see in urban America today are essentially non-political problems where policing has failed and violent crime has, has increased relative to, to the recent past. I don't, again, I don't see that as, as, as a road to civil war. That's just a return to the elevated uh, homicide rates of, of, of the relatively recent past. We're still far from where we were at the peak of, uh, of the violent crime wave. Uh, in the late 20th century. And our, our troubles with transfer of power for the moment are expressing themselves in the legal system uh, as opposed to, you know, despite what happened a year ago on January 6th, uh, legal system as opposed to uh, uh, violence. HR, your thoughts, keeping in mind that three retired army generals wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post last month suggesting that the 2024 election could be taken over by a military insurrection. Yeah, I think that's crazy, by the way. And I think what they were basically... Uh, 
saying is that is that they think it could be a you know could be a coup, but I don't think right. I don't think they really implied a, a the U.S. military you know yeah. it would, would be behind it. I think they saw the sort of the growth of these militias as a problem, which it is. But you know I do think that the reports that there were large numbers of the U.S. military that are radicalized in in a, in a way that would would condone the use of violence against our government. I think that is just not accurate. You know, and I, I know there are statistics out there that one in 10 of, of those who were involved in the, in the, in the breach of the Capitol or certain elements of January 6th had, had a military background or affiliation. But what does, what does that really mean? I mean, does that mean that they were, you know, brief members of the national guard? Does it mean they were thrown out because they were chaptered out of the military and didn't make it through or didn't make it through basic training. So I think you really have to look at the statistics themselves but of course, also not take it lightly either, right? I think what we're seeing in large measure today is a loss of confidence in in the, in the among large numbers of Americans that that they can that, that the government can can um, advance and protect their interests, or that they can affect change, right, in the nature of the government through their vote through the democratic process. And I think that's what we ought to be really concerned about is restoring co- confidence uh, among among Americans who've lost confidence. And, you know, it's not just the far right or whatever this group was on January 6th. It, it's it's other uh, other you know, political movements or anarchist movements that, again, aren't either aren't new either. Right. I mean, remember, you remember the, uh, you know, the the, um, you know, the the World Trade Organization uh, protests in Seattle, you know, years ago and so forth uh, on the far left. So anyway, I, I really think what we need is civics education. We need, you know, and we need to restore people's confidence in, in, in democratic governance, because that's the strength of our democracy, right, is that we have the means for change and reform short of revolution. And and uh, and I think that's what we ought to be working on bolstering. OK, question from Nikki in London. She writes and she calls herself, quote, a student at a top law school with a job offer from a top global law firm about to graduate. She writes, quote, can each of the fellows discuss achievement, success and insecurity, e.g. not doing well enough, not being invited to Davos while peers are and state what it means to achieve and succeed and whether those words have taken on a different meaning for them as they have gotten older. Additionally, when what is, quote, unquote, enough? Well, not getting invited to Davos can be a kind of badge of honor. And I, I can remember it uh, a number of years when I was uh, made aware that I had uh, I had blotted my copybook and was no longer on the A-list. And I felt a certain pride. And then my heart sank rather when I got invited uh, back and had been rehabilitated. It was a relief when the World Economic Forum was forced by Omicron to uh, to postpone its, its January meeting. Because in, in a way, when you get to something like Davos, there's this terrible realization that 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 it's a lot of rather self-important people wandering around a conference center with such high levels of security that it's like being in an airport without any flights. You just keep going through security. So a key thing I think to to realize is that most of the things that in your twenties you aspire to are deeply disappointing when you get to them in your 30s or 40s and by the time you're in your 50s you're you're spending time thinking of excuses to avoid going to them because in truth the glittering prizes the the accolades that we aspire to when we're when we're young are not really the things that that matter in life what matters in life is is a fulfilling whatever potential you have with integrity and and perhaps more importantly uh, being uh, a good person, uh, a good father, uh, or a good parent, I should say, a good sibling, uh, a, a, a good son or grandson, those are the things that matter. And going to Davos by comparison with those things is is just a kind of, uh, it's the kind of, of prize that, that you shouldn't care too much about. HR1 is enough enough. Yeah, I, I would just I would just uh, tie into what Neil said. I mean, I, I think that so much in life these days has become performative rather than formative, right? And mm-hmm. and uh, and and I, I think that we we celebrate people who are, you know, who are famous or well known mainly for just being famous or well known <laughs> rather than accomplishing anything that is helping to build a better future, contribute to our society, and and so I, I think we ought to we ought to judge ourselves maybe and and uh, 
and 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 recognize others who actually contribute to to building a better future and get back to that rather than you know flashy photos on Instagram whether they come from Davos or or, or anywhere. I want to. I, I I think our our questioner uh, has a good point, which one should be aware of, especially when one is younger. That most of the institutions we operate in are right now taken over by a political movement that uh, rewards a particular fantasy narrative, or at least from my point of view, a fantasy narrative. And that if you choose one path to accolades, to quick promotions, to fancy jobs, to prizes, to recognition by professional organizations, to having your name in the New York Times, to Davos, to political advancement and so forth, is to be part of the cheerleaders for this particular narrative. And if you choose, as we have, uh, to buck that trend, to speak honestly, to question that narrative, it's going to cost you. Uh, It's going to cost you in those transitory rewards. Uh, You'll have people saying mean things about you in, in newspapers. You will not get invited to presidencies of associations and to prizes and and all those things. Uh, So why do you do it? Well, because, you you know, deep down inside, there's much greater satisfaction when you get a little older of of being right, (laughs) of not having sold your soul for uh, those advantages. There's the eternal hope uh, of the conservative that sooner or later, the, the conservative, the libertarian, the free marketer, it's like being a Chicago Cubs fan, sooner or later, the world must come to its senses, face basic facts, and, and perhaps you will get some measure of the recognition uh, that you want, because it, you, do, you don't want to just write for yourself and, and think for yourself. You, you do want the world to know what you've thought. So it's a hard road to follow, but uh, I, think, I think you sleep much better at night in, in the road of uh, truth and honesty, wherever it leads you, uh, although I think it tends to lead us, and of course, I think it leads us where we We've gone, but don't, don't, don't let's not make light of of the um, uh, of the costs that you'll have over your life if you do that. Okay, John, let's stick with you. You got a question uh, to you from Igor in the Ukraine, and Igor writes, "Quote a question request to John Cochran. I've been following your blog since 2013, and specifically your comments on tax policy. Most of it can be summarized under quote lower the rates, broaden the base, get rid of all sorts of deductions and special clauses, tax, consum- tax consumption, not income mantra." Can you give a more nuanced comment on how to set up an effective consumption tax that is unavoidable to pay and is least harmless to businesses? Any real world examples? <laughs> 30 seconds or less. <laughs> and 30 seconds or less, right, Bill? Uh, so there's, there are um, simple principles of optimal taxation, which get forgotten all the time in policy. Uh, don't link the tax to what you're going to spend it on. Those are two separate issues. Uh, like Igor said, I think Igor said it beautifully. Uh, you want... So so taxes distort economic activity. When you tax something heavily, people do less of it, and that's bad for the economy, bad for growth, bad for all sorts of things. So you want to tax everything a little bit in proportion, and you want to tax things that is hard for people to get out of, like consumption. And don't our problem is our tax code is trying to do 120,000 different things and does all of them badly. And I would put in, uh, uh, you know, simplicity and transparency are as important as low, stable, predictable, marginal rates on on all sorts of things. Our tax code is a complex nightmare. Uh, If the the peasants with pitchforks understood what was going on, then then we would have some some riots. Uh, So straightforward and simple is, and, and I think trying to separate things into different buckets. If you're trying to subsidize activities and transfer income and raise revenue for the government all in the same thing, uh, it's going to be a bloody mess. So let's uh, let's try to have a tax code that raises revenue and and send people checks when you want to uh, uh, subsidize things. That kind of uh, separation, I think, would lead to cleaner, simpler, more growth in energy taxes. And there I'll stop, although I could go on for an hour. <laughs> HR, question to you from David in South Carolina. He writes, quote, do you foresee the U.S. getting deeply involved militarily if Russia decides to launch an all-out invasion of Ukraine? He adds, quote, P.S. General McMaster was one of my biggest role models as a soldier, a great patriot and leader. Uh, that's so kind. I, th- I think actually, though, we, we already are militarily involved because it's important you know, that that we deter a conflict in, in Ukraine. And while there's been a, a lot of emphasis on on economic sanctions and consequences to try to deter Putin. Mm -hmm. I think that military deterrence is still quite important, not only in connection with Ukraine itself, 
but aggression beyond Ukraine uh, or an, an intimidation of NATO countries like Romania and Bulgaria and others in the, in the Black Sea region, as well as the Baltic states. So I think I think what's missing right now uh, in, in the effort to confront Russian aggression uh, is the military component. I mean, I, I think, for example, we should probably be deploying a joint task force of some kind, a multinational task force to Romania uh, to, to, to bolster the, the confidence of of our NATO allies that, that we will check Russian aggression if they do invade Ukraine. But I would just I would point to to, to Neil's uh, excellent uh, essay recently on in Bloomberg, where I think that we, we have to be really careful not to underestimate the chances of a full invasion of Ukraine. I think that that uh, Neil lays it out quite clearly that this is really part of of Putin's obsession with establishing Novo Russia, right? And and uh, and and it's it's linked to a number of motivating factors for him. So how do you deter it? I mean, you 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 pose Russia with the prospect of uh, of costs that are unacceptable and go far beyond what he might have factored in uh, at the outset of this aggressive action. And and that, that's certainly uh, cannot be done exclusively with the threat of of economic sanctions. Can I ask you, HR, um, I'm still simmering over the fact that in, I think it was 1990, the U.S. and NATO gave Ukraine a written guarantee of territorial integrity if they would give up their nuclear weapons, which they did. Uh, <clears throat> well, that's looking like not the smartest thing in the world. Uh, and I think Iran and North Korea uh, noticed. They also noticed what happened to Libya that gave up its nuclear weapons. Hasn't Putin won in the sense that we're not we're not talking about give back Crimea anymore? Uh, if you just swallowed Crimea, we're really talking about stop the sanctions and get back to normal, and I get to keep Crimea. Yeah, I, I think so. And this is this is part of the. And you've seen the ultimatum essentially in the in the list of demands, and, and Neil. Uh, goes through these in in his in his essay. He's great, uh, you know that that have you know that would really actually make NATO irrelevant if if if, if, uh, if the United States and our European allies were to accede to these demands. So I, I think that uh, this is it is important. I think what we should be doing is is uh, is be more committed to material support to the to Ukrainians. I think that, I, I don't know why there aren't there isn't a huge airlift of defensive weapons. Uh, already underway uh, to, to the Ukrainian armed forces. I mean, javelin Biden, missiles. Biden's already said we're not going to fight. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, yeah, let's I, get... right. We'll, only, we'll only respond militarily after he invades Ukraine. I, I really don't understand how that works in, in uh, from the perspective of deterrence. Let's get Neil to close this out. Neil, Neil, let me add this letter that we got uh, to you from Togo in England, who writes, I would like to tempt Neil Ferguson and H.R. McMaster to give an estimate of the probability of Russia invading Ukraine this year. Bonus points for estimates on the probability of such an invasion extending beyond the Donbass. Well, I think the probability of military action uh, is is pretty high. I'd say it's about 50 percent. The the current uh, diplomatic maneuvers are not, I think, in good faith on the Russian side. The demands that the Russians have made, as HR rightly said, uh, were they to be accepted, would render the enlarged NATO essentially uh, an empty shell. Uh, I think it's highly unlikely that the Russians think they're going to get even 20% of what they've asked for. So this is the prelude to conflict. But the question you're asking is whether it's going to be a full-blown invasion that could see Russian forces as far uh, into Ukraine as Kiev, the capital itself. Now, I think the probability of that is quite low uh, because that would be costly and difficult. And although the Ukrainian forces would be overwhelmed, there is enough commitment to maintaining Ukrainian independence for there to be guerrilla warfare, and it would be costly to Russia. So the options, I think, on open to Putin are, are, are significantly less costly than that. And they include ramping things up in the Donbass. I mean, remember, the Russians have, in effect, already invaded Ukraine. They mm -hmm. invaded in 2014, and they annexed Crimea, and they have Russian backed proxies in right. the Donbass region. So it's not as if that invasion didn't already happen. The question is, do they go further and how much further? My sense is that you could also see naval operations in the Black Sea. You could see cyber warfare designed to disable Ukrainian infrastructure and communications. All of this, I think, is quite likely to happen. But uh, but Russian tanks in Kiev, no, I think that's a pretty low probability scenario in my view, because that would be too costly uh, for Putin. And remember, although Putin is, is intent on maximizing his own legitimacy and playing uh, to Russian nationalism, there's a limit to how many dead Russians he can, in fact, uh, 
uh, sustain. It, it, it's not as if his popularity is that profound. So the sacrifices that he can expect uh, the Russian people to make for taking over Ukraine are, are actually not that great, which is why I think this will be a relatively limited escalation uh, in the east of the country. Hey, I, I think we have to remember that this the war is already happening, as Neil's saying. I mean, I think there, there already is, is violence in, 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 in uh, Ukraine. 14,000 Ukrainians have died uh, in this in this conflict already. Uh, I would also just highlight what Neil already highlighted as well, which is Ukrainian armed forces are much better than they were uh, in 2014. They would inflict, I think, significant losses on the Russians if they if they attacked. Um, and I think we have to make that clear. The other, the only other point I would make is we have to place this, I think, in broader context of Russian aggression more broadly. And again, in pursuit of establishing Novo Russia, there's a crisis ongoing in Kazakhstan right now, which is going to provide a pretense, I think, for Russian intervention there. Right. And, and, and and of course, his sights go across the whole territory of the former Soviet Union uh, with the intervention in, in Belarus to support Lukashenko there and, and, and a potential, you know, maybe an agreement at some point for Belarus to rejoin uh, you know, Russia. Um, and then, of course, the, the threats that are that are oriented on the Baltic states. And now, of course, maybe Russia's ability to take advantage of uh, of a, a lot of internal uh, internal turbulence and 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 um, political infighting in Poland, right over the over the spying scandal and so forth. So, I, I just think that you know Putin is trying to do his best to disrupt really across Europe, uh, to 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 divide, uh, to and to weaken NATO, uh, and again all in pursuit of of reestablishing Novo Russia. Isn't isn't the hundred percent probability that there will be something going on in Ukraine? Little green men, chaos, some pretext for something. Uh, it leads to call it greater autonomy, call it whatever you want. And the point of all the soldiers on the border is NATO, don't you dare interfere in this thing because then he has a pretext to, oh, we're just saving that heart. You know, he has to respond to something in order to invade. And NATO is very good at, at we don't want to uh, cause things that would escalate here. So the, aren't the troops there as a threat? Don't respond when I stir up trouble inside. That's then that's like 100%. Right. And, and of course, this is not unprecedented, right? I'm, I'm reading uh, Roger Morehouse's excellent book, Poland 1939, right now. And, <laughs> and, uh, and it was precisely the, 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 uh, the scenario uh, in, it to, to, to create a pretense for an invasion of, of Poland. Okay, another question for Neil. Neil, this comes from somebody who buys your books. Marcel in Zurich writes, in your book, Doom, you devote a whole chapter on, quote, the return of non-alignment. Where do you see Europe heading in 2022 towards being truly non-aligned or pivoting towards the U.S. or even China? Well, I'm always happy to answer questions from people who buy my books. Uh, the uh, the non-alignment analogy is with the first Cold War, when a significant number of, of countries declined to take sides. Uh, India, for example, uh, Yugoslavia. And uh, I've argued that we're already in Cold War II, but the question is, will there be a non-aligned movement? And could it be that this time a significant number of European countries, as well as some Asian countries, uh, opt to be uh, non-aligned, i.e. decline to uh, line them up with either the United States or, in the case of Cold War II, the People's Republic of China? The key issue, and I raised it in Doom, is, is actually Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, German opinion uh, in the period of Angela Merkel's chancellorship really moved towards a kind of neutrality. And some polling that was done in 2020 by the Kerber Foundation found that Germans would prefer to be equidistant between the United States or China, or perhaps even uh, lent slightly towards China. Now, that was partly, I think, a reflection of anti-Trump sentiments, uh, which was very strong in Germany. That has diminished, uh, of course, this year uh, since a change in the White House. But more importantly, Angela Merkel is no longer Chancellor of Germany. Uh, and although uh, the new Chancellor, Olaf Scholz, is not exactly a uh, uh, hawk, uh, red of tooth and claw, the new government uh, is significantly uh, tougher, I think, towards China as well as towards Russia than the Merkel uh, coalition was, because the new government has the Greens and the FDP in it, the Free Democrats. So I think the non-alignment uh, temptation is probably somewhat diminished. We also notice that uh, Emmanuel Macron, who's up for re-election in France this year, uh, has tried and rather failed 
uh, to make nice with Beijing and Moscow in his uh, his attempt to play the part of uh, of De Gaulle marked two. So I, I sense in in French calls for strategic autonomy for Europe, uh, not just a desire to distance Europe from the United States, but also a desire to beef European defences up with respect to the powers of the East. So I would say that non-aligned temptation has diminished somewhat in 2021. And I look ahead and what I see is a more aggressive Russia and a more assertive China. And I think Europeans are gradually going to realize, you know what, if we can't be non-aligned, which is pretty hard to do, we're probably better off staying aligned with the United States, because after all, it's the United States that provides a really big part of European security to this day. All right, a question for all three of you to take a swing at. This comes from Andrew in Burlingame, California, who writes, quote, the Hoover Institution has faced threats to its independence due to voicing opinions that went against the accepted narrative around public health. Your institution remains a strong home for independent voices, but many students like myself do not have access to such a space at our level of study. What do you recommend for undergraduate students to find more open and thoughtful spaces in lower level academia? Hmm. Who wants to go first? Yeah, I'll, just, I'll, just, I'll, just, I'll just offer a general approach. A general approach, I think, is to, to, I, to always you know, say to your fellow students, don't accept anybody's orthodoxy, right? Question everything. Read a, a broad range of views on, on any topic and, and be suspect <laughs> of, any, of any academic department or professors, anyone who tries to force on, onto you a way of, of thinking. And then the second is to question assumptions. When you hear sort of conventional wisdom or uh, interpretation of history that, that is suspect, so ask the question, what are the assumptions on, on which this interpretation of history is based? And are those assumptions valid or invalid? And, and I think in doing that, in, in applying sort of a rational approach to, to thinking about the contemporary challenges we face or, or historical interpretations, um, inter- 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 interpretations of history, I, I don't think you can go wrong with that a- approach overall. I'll tell you a story about a student who came to see me at the end of last year, a Stanford student, who said he was depressed by the groupthink, the, the woke atmosphere on campus. He found it was... Uh, disillusioning to feel under such pressure to conform. And I, I listened to, to his, uh, his remarks and I asked him, well, how many kindred spirits have you encountered since you came to Stanford amongst your fellow students? And he said, oh, I, I guess around eight or nine. I said, that's amazingly good. I mean, to have eight or nine kindred spirits early on in your, your career, that's, that's great going. Uh, because I'm not sure that I would have counted as many as eight early in my Oxford undergraduate career. The most important thing at a university, whatever the prevailing uh, conventional wisdom is to to find those kindred spirits Mm -hmm. and, you know, associate and think and talk with them. Uh, Of course, in an ideal world, every university would have a Hoover institution. And that, of course, is what should have been done when the opportunity existed. It couldn't possibly happen today. But in the absence of 100 Hoover institutions on any campus, it's still possible to find your kindred spirits and take advantage of your your right of of free association. And that that seems to me one of the most important things about the experience of being at university. It's not actually what happens in the classroom. It's what happens in the unofficial time that you spend together with your with your kindred spirits. I would add to that, uh, look for people, not institutions. So there are, even among very, very liberal departments, there are people who believe in freedom of speech, expression, different views. Uh, find those people. Um, it, the Hoover doesn't teach, but most of our senior fellows have joint appointments in departments. So you want to take classes from Hoover Institution just go cross link our website with those department websites and find those people and get to know them. Uh, Neil said it and I'll say it again. Organizations, uh, remember de Tocqueville's version of America that you put three Americans together and they start a club with a president, vice president, treasurer, secretary. There are already organizations to help students to express ideas and to defend themselves against uh, against attacks when, when expressions go wrong. And if you don't like the ones that you find, uh, start a new one um, and get some more going. Stanford, also I want to put in a good word for us, our higher administration isn't very loud about it, but they do actually support Hoover and they just support diversity of opinion and thought and, 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 and actual facts. 
Um, so they will, in the end, uh, when when forced to it, back back you up if most of the time if you get in trouble. But it's going to, you know, there's a bureaucracy that's going to get in the way, and and don't be afraid to say no when when because uh, because peak woke is passing, and, and a lot of people recognize that this uh, this kind of thing cannot last in American uh, universities. Neil, here's a related question to you, and uh, take a minute and hydrate, my friend, because it'll take me a minute to read this. It comes from Max in London, who writes, quote, I'm a first-year history undergraduate at Cambridge with an interest in becoming a professional historian. I'm rather interested in 19th century high political and diplomatic history and what's typically considered more, quote-unquote, conservative history. I was wondering, Neil, if you had any advice in navigating my way in the academic world since this history is seemingly, quote-unquote, outdated and far from being in accordance with current trends of postmodern historiography. He adds, quote, I also want to say that I owe you, along with Andrew Roberts, as a lot of devouring your works was a reason why I worked my arse off to study history at Oxbridge and ultimately become a historian. That's ass for American listeners. Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, I'm almost tempted to say, abandon hope, all ye who enter here, but I'm not going to be quite so discouraging. It, it's certainly a much more hostile environment than existed when Andrew Roberts and I were undergraduates at, respectively, uh, Cambridge and Oxford. And I think uh, if we try to have uh, the careers that we've had now, if Andrew Roberts and I mir miraculously 18 or 19 again, it wouldn't it wouldn't work uh, because it's certainly become much, much harder uh, to pursue an academic career as I did uh, with uh, signs of of conservative sympathies early on. Uh, now, that doesn't mean you should just throw in the towel. It's extremely important uh, not to do that because we do need historians. Uh, one of the most important parts of that civics education HR talked about is in fact done by historians. And historians have to work hard these days against highly ideological propaganda versions of history. See, for example, the 1619 Project, which competes not just for public attention, but for airtime in classrooms. So you mustn't throw in the towel. Uh, you'll just have to pick your way a little bit more gingerly through the the maze of of, of academic employment than than we did. But but I I offer the following encouragement. What I see on both sides of the Atlantic at the moment are concrete attempts to build new institutional paths and opportunities. Postdoctoral fellows like the Hoover Fellowships that we created here at Hoover, the May Fellowships at the Belfer Center at, at Harvard. Uh, there's a new university in embryonic form in, in Austin, in which I'm involved. There's a, a, a concrete, a tangible effort to address this problem. It's a real problem uh, in the sense that it's very hard for anybody who's spotted uh, as a conservative early in their career now to expect a path to a tenure track position in a major institution. That is very clear in history because most departments are ideologically skewed far to the left. But don't abandon hope. There are efforts underway. And by the time you're finished your PhD, should you go down that route, uh, there ought to be a significant improvement in the job outlook for somebody like you. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, John, I want to direct this to you because this comes from a uh, viewer in your hometown. Ken in Chicago writes, quote, what do you see for the future of larger cities in the U.S.? You've spoken at length about California and San Francisco, but what about a Midwest city like Chicago? Increasing taxes, increasing crime, fewer jobs, fewer events slash restaurants, worse public school system. Any hope? John? Teachers on, teachers, uh, <laughs> on strike, essentially. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the teachers walked out. The uh, <clears throat> Very interesting today. Uh, Eric Adams is, is hope for New York, but at the same time, the uh, the prosecutor for New York announced a whole list of crimes that will no longer be prosecuted. So good luck to Adams in imp implementing things. Uh, you know, it's not like there's a lack of knowledge about what works in cities and, and what doesn't. Um, and I, you know, I'll put, I'll try to put on my uh, optimistic HR McMaster hat that hopefully we can, it looks like we're going to run through the 1970s to the 1980s, except this time as farce and, and twice as fast. Uh, and so I, I can only hope that the twice as fast uh, happens twice as fast. You know, people are, people are certainly waking up uh, to what the teachers unions have done to their schools and hopefully they will vote accordingly. We, we still live in a democracy where once people get, when they want more cops, they can vote for people who who give them more cops and and uh, more better public schools and so forth. So uh, you know we we know we all know there's no need to repeat, 
the dangers of high taxes, overregulation, uh, unions, pensions, city bankruptcies, dysfunction, crime, the loop that crime, people leaving, uh, no more businesses, more people leave. Uh, you know, you, you've seen the ashes, the, the, the craters of cities that have gone down that before. Um, it's, it's not a miracle what you got to do. So um, I, I just, I have the hope that we can repeat what we did before, even, even a little smarter. I mean, there's, there's, there's some, we could do a lot better job on criminal justice. Um, uh, you know, um, it's not just go back to the sort of, to, to a medieval walk them up mentality when, and a lot better job on schools. Uh, so I, I have hope. I, I, and I see even among, you know, people who call themselves liberals, the YIMBY movement is, is uh, a great hope in, in San Francisco. So people, uh, it's not like it's a mystery and uh, we just got to get our act together. Mm-hmm. Neil, HR, any thoughts? Well, I come from Glasgow, a city that touched bottom when I was still a kid in the 1970s. And I always think it's encouraging to look at how Glasgow got out of its uh, post-industrial mess and, and, and has now established itself as a dynamic and attractive uh, city. I, I, I think if you look at the case of San Francisco, uh, it's amazing how quickly you can tank uh, a really nice city. Because right. when I first came to Hoover, which is close to 20 years ago, I really enjoyed coming here, partly because of the time I would spend in San Francisco. Well, rename it San Francisco, to quote the title of Michael Schellenberger's new book, and you get a good idea of, of a city that makes Chicago look good. I mean, you'd rather walk down the streets of Chicago right now than the streets of, of San Francisco. Uh, so it's impressive how quickly San Francisco has been uh, not quite destroyed, but certainly uh, badly, badly de- damaged and defaced by terrible policies. As John says, the right policies could fix this just as rapidly. But for that, you need some political will. I'm encouraged by the fact that the elites in San Francisco seem finally to be waking up to the consequences of giving power to progressives uh, and and allowing completely dysfunctional policies to prevail. So eventually, the brain, as it were, of the dinosaur feels the pain in its tail. But it's a slow process politically. And in Chicago, I don't know. I mean, I've been going there on and off for many years, John, and it's 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 hard to see much sign of how Chicago fixes itself. Maybe I'm missing something, but there you seem to have a very a very un, sort of unhappy low equilibrium. People seem willing to tolerate areas of the city that are no go zones. Well, but Chicago, my Chicago of the 1970s was a lot like your Glasgow of the 1970s, and it was far worse then. Right. Uh, than it is now. I, I had to uh, navigate uh, gang territory boundaries on my way to school in, in Chicago in the 1970s. And it, it too, you know, it, it fixed its schools to some extent and it, it started growing again and, and crime went way down. Um, so those things are possible in, in Chicago as well. But there is also, you know, there's the Detroit example. It is possible for there to be a doom loop where the politicians understand that their electoral base is is not the people who have jobs and businesses and who are very threatened by uh, that by things that that clean it up and and everybody is bu- too busy eating at the carcass to uh, to to uh, get the thing to revive uh, and you know that 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 confluence of interests who are are each trying to uh, you know the teachers union wants to pre- preserve its power and its pensions at the expense of everybody else no one's going to give in and and you can just spiral and and never and, and everybody who could vote for something better moves to the you know the elites in San Francisco who voted for the progressives just move out to their Tahoe and and Sonoma houses and that's the end of that Okay, another question for uh, directed to John, but I want all three of you to weigh in on this. Uh, David and Charlotte writes, as a longtime subscriber slash listener slash reader of just about any and everything the Hoover Institution puts out, plus a subscriber to the Grumpy Economist. I have a question for John Cochran and the other good fellows. John in particular has had good things to say about the incoming Secretary of Treasury, Janet Yellen. I'd like to hear what he thinks about her now that she's had some time in her new role and what he thinks about some of the policy slash initiatives she stated. I'd also like to hear from the other good fellows concerning the performance or lack thereof of the other players in President Biden's cabinet. So, John, Janet Yellen. I am very reluctant to talk about personalities because I've known Janet since I was a graduate student. She's a a fine person and anybody's attempts to discredit Janet or anyone else from their motivations hits a brick wall with with a very nice person. Now that said, the administration is 
uh, following some what I think are very uh, unwise policies and, and policies that I'm surprised that the Janet Yellen that I know is not at least, you know, when you're in the administration, you lose some and then you say, fine, you know, I'm, I'm not going to cause a fuss about this, but I don't have to go on the Sunday talk shows and talk about it. So, uh, for example, uh, weaponizing financial regulation to go after uh, uh, to go after climate policy seems like a uh, a very bad idea. And the structure, the Build Back Better plan, <clears throat> the structure of it was uh, um, really incompetently done. Forget about just the amounts and the deficits and so forth, but the nature of these social programs. Now, of course, you know Janet wasn't writing those; those were written in Congress. Um, so with that said, um, you know, the policies from a sort of standard economic view is the policies coming out of the administration are, are not great. Neil in HR, the Biden cabinet. Well, I think we owe them a debt of gratitude and you'll be surprised to hear me say that. Uh, but I think we owe them a debt of gratitude because they have so quickly in the space of a year proved to be true. So very many important principles, for example, they have shown that it is in fact the case that if you allow rampant monetary growth uh, and if you allow, allow uh, deficits to blow out, uh, you will get inflation. Uh, you will in fact get inflation uh, above 6% in, in a very short space of time. And that gets rid of the bogus uh, modern monetary theory uh, that assured us uh, that the deficit could be any size the government wanted, uh, there would be no inflationary uh, downside. So thank you, uh, Biden administration, for proving Milton Friedman right in, in less than a year. Thank you also for proving that if you signal that your southern border is essentially open, large numbers of people will take advantage of that fact and uh, create a great influx of uh, illegal uh, immigrants. Thanks also uh, for proving uh, that if you signal uh, that you will not be supportive of policing, there will be an escalation uh, in, in crime. And, and finally, I think, thanks to the Biden administration uh, for backing ideas uh, of wokeness in education that are so deeply unpopular, uh, they helped Glenn Youngkin win the governorship uh, of Virginia. So from my vantage point, this administration is doing a terrific job uh, of showing uh, how many fundamental uh, conservative or classical liberal principles still hold true. Can I just follow up on that before HR's turn, which I, mm -hmm. you know I'm jumping the line here, because what Neil said is wonderful, and and my view that we're replaying the the 1970s as farce at, at triple speed <laughs> certainly comes out with inflation. You know, inflation came up when nobody thought it was going to come, and the list of excuses uh, which have been you know simply replayed. Uh, from the 1970s. First, it was supply shocks. I don't know if you remember those. Then it was transitory. Then it was greed. Oh, <clears> and yeah, then it was that's, monopolies. That's hats off to Elizabeth Warren for bringing back the notion that inflation is, in fact, a result of business collusion. I mean, that, that really was like going down memory lane, wasn't it? That's back from the Middle Ages, right, Neil? We, we go after, we go on a witch hunt. Profiteers. And, and profiteers and, and the hoarders. Now, of course, price controls are, are back in vogue from the left. The modern monetary theorists, completely unapologetic, are, are reviving the idea that price controls is a great idea, uh, including misusing the history of, of what happened after World War II, where countries that kept those in were in disastrous shape forever. Well, how, uh, how, about, how about the experience of Argentina and Chile? I mean, it seems like it's <laughs> yeah, exactly. The 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 my the dog ate my homework. Set of uh, attempts at spinning this one have just been uh, provide lots of economic humor. Let's say. <laughs> HR. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll just say, you know, it's, of course, it's it's mixed. You know, I, maybe I'll, I'll start with, uh, I think the policy toward China has had a great deal of continuity and appropriately so. I think the, the, the star of the cabinet, from my perspective so far, is Gina Raimondo, the, the, uh, the, the Secretary of, of Commerce, because I think she's been quite good. Uh, on following up on the, on the competitive approach to China and and uh, countering really Chinese economic warfare, uh, and then and then I think that but but overall the, the foreign policy I think has suffered from this you know they have strategic narcissism like the idea that 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 outcomes depend on what we decide to do or decide not to do and you see that in connection with the the, the uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan an utter disaster you see that also with the you know the the professed again. Uh, disengagement from from the Middle East without without the recognition that hey things actually can get worse there, 
You see this with the supplication. I don't know what other word to use uh, to the Iranians in connection with trying to resurrect an Iran nuclear deal that's already dead. And, and I, I think you, you see it with this, then also the perception of just profound weakness associated with this approach to foreign policy and the emboldenment uh, of, of, uh, of both Putin uh, and Xi Jinping. So from a, I think from a foreign policy, national security perspective, quite low marks. I think we ought to be paying attention to the national security strategy when it comes out. Maybe they'll explain what a national security strategy is for the middle class. I don't know what that is. Um, but then also, I think the defense strategy is, is we're likely to get more of this, you know, let's do more with less, right? So we're talking about the need to compete and deter China, but we, we haven't actually, I don't think, the administration hasn't done anything to make the investments in defense that are, that are necessary, the changes to our, our, our defense capabilities uh, to do that, or haven't done that to, to a sufficient degree. Mm -hmm. so there's one thing below the radar screen that I want to point out that they've been amazingly effective at, and that is getting their people burrowed quickly into the administrative agencies, kicking the Trump people out and taking those over. Uh, that is going to have a permanence long past the 2022 elections, uh, which is, uh, you know, from a partisan advantage point of view, they, they did that very quickly <clears throat> uh, and effectively. HR, a question to you from Dallas in Sydney, Australia, who writes, quote, China's growing economic problems are likely to head to work via mass militarization, but what will cause China to run out of foreign currency very quickly? Have we learned the lessons from Korea, Vietnam, and Iraq, and now all agree that MacArthur was right, and are we communicating that to Xi Jinping? Yeah, well, I'll ask Neil and, and John to talk about the economic dimension of this. But I mean, for, for me, I, I think that, you know, a, a centralized authoritarian system, uh, you know, this this sort of statist economic model, it, it has severe disadvantages. And, and I think that what you see is in Xi Jinping's race to catch up to and maybe surpass the United States, they've created frailties across all of their systems. Uh, and, and, and that in combination with the party's obsession with control, right? The, the fear of losing their exclusive grip on power uh, it, it has, has resulted in, in, in a combination of you know, a crisis in the real estate uh, sector, uh, but and also a stifling of the, the innovative uh, part of the economy uh, that have been associated with more of the, you know, the private sector activities and investments rather than the state-owned enterprises, which they're doubling down on, for example. So you know, of course, uh, John and, and Neil could talk more about this. There have been predictions over many years, right, of the imminent collapse of a system that didn't appear sustainable from the outside. But I think Xi Jinping actually has created very significant frailties and weaknesses uh, in, in the Chinese economy. Uh, and and, uh, and this is a time, I think, for us to maybe emphasize our competitive advantages. And in particular, I would say stop underwriting uh, the, the, uh, the, the Chinese economy. Uh, with the vast flows of, of U.S. investment that's gone into China, again, under the false assumption that China, having been welcomed into the international financial and economic order, uh, would play by the rules and, and would liberalize over time. Mm -hmm. I'll Deal. keep it brief. Ch uh, China's in trouble, actually, in a really interesting way. I, I don't expect a, a China crisis or, or collapse. That, that's been predicted uh, umpteen times over the last 20 or 30 years. But I do see a China slowdown inevitably coming. Uh, it's almost uh, not clear to me that they'll be able to achieve 5% growth this year. Uh, and, and I'm sure they'll announce it, but it's going to be a struggle. One big problem they have is that they have a zero COVID policy in the face of the Omicron variant that's unsustainable. And they don't have vaccines to uh, really to, to ward off the ill effects of Omicron. So they're in trouble there. That's going to be a major issue, at least for the next two quarters. Uh, they are really in trouble in the sense that their property sector and their tech sectors reeled last year, mainly from uh, deliberate government action. And now they're having to ease monetary policy and uh, abandon the idea of a property tax to try to keep the show on the road. I think it's going to be quite hard for Xi Jinping to get through this crucial year, to get to the 20th Party Congress and confirm that he's leader for life when the economy is so obviously struggling. I think he'll do it because I think his control is sufficiently great. Uh, at the top of the party. But I think it'd be worth watching closely. Can China actually get through this final phase of the pandemic as it transitions into endemic with measures that might have worked in 2020, but now seem completely inappropriate uh, for the Omicron wave? 
Mm -hmm. John? I will add to, to our questioner, <clears throat> a country who has exported as much as China is not about to run out of foreign currency. They're still sitting on a whole big pile of our treasury debt along with the foreign assets. And mm -hmm. they're still exporting, uh, exporting a lot. Their, their problem is, in fact, what do you do with all the foreign currency you're accumulating? Uh, the growth China has experienced was not from the state. The big growth came from the state stepping back and letting entrepreneurs and, and the private sector expand. And uh, now they're trying to put the kibosh on that. But, but their various industrial policy ideas the last 10 years never worked out. Uh, all the stuff that came was, was a surprise to them. And so now they are not only trying to direct things where they want, but of course, everything changes every, every year, whatever was last year, the rules always change. Now, changing the rules all the time is great for keeping people in line, but it's terrible for trying to run an economy uh, halfway successfully. Uh, so yeah, how do we get out of real estate? How do they uh, balance their budgets, basically? Because they've made a lot of money off of selling land. Well, you know, once you've sold land, you, you run out of selling land. So I think as you try to turn a, a entrepreneurial private part of the economy into a state-run economy, which is always going to be a chaotic, whatever's on Xi Jinping's mind these days, he never seems to keep his mind straight on whatever he wants to do for more than about a year. Uh, the natural result is extreme caution and stagnation. To not collapse at stagnation. Even the Russians, the Russians stagnated from 1950 to 1989. Uh, they, there wasn't a sudden economic collapse. And I think that's uh, that's likely, you know, China is going to hit the, the middle income limit of uh, the much level of GDP per capita as you can get out of a very authoritarian state. And they know that if they liberalize, well, then that's going to cause political problems. And I think that's 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 going to cause even stagnation is going to be politically problematic for Xi Jinping. On a related China note, a question from Sehun in Florida who writes, will the hypersonic arms race lead to the second space race in history? Can we still catch up and win like last time? And from economic and strategic perspectives, why or why not should we try? Neil? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, that's ahead, one for HR for sure. HR? Well, I, I said we, we can catch up. We, we actually were, we got behind because we weren't competing, right? We assumed that that space would be benign, you know, and, and not be a competitive environment. Uh, well, we know, and this is all open source now, that the Russians and the Chinese both have developed, you know, space weapons, you know, so, so now what are we doing? Well, we're, we're making our, our space systems much more resilient, right? Instead of having, you know, really exquisite, massive set and a few number of satellites, we can put up, you know, we can put up hundreds of satellites quite quickly. Now uh, we, we also have now the opportunity to work with other countries, right? So our communications and critical space-based capabilities run through sort of multinational assets. So if, if, if the hostile actor is going to take us on, they're going to take on France and Germany and, 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 uh, and, and Japan and Brazil, you know, and, and so I think that's an important aspect of deterrence as well on hypersonics. I don't think we're as far behind as some people have said, but uh, we did get behind and that is a, that is a transformative weapon system, but, but no weapon is, is ever decisive, you know, kind of in and of itself, right? You have, you know, the submarine, the sonar, the bomber, the radar, the machine gun, the tank, the tank, the anti-tank missile. And so now what we have to do is, I think, develop a range of defensive capabilities and also deterrent capabilities so that so that uh, so, so that we, you know, we, we can prevent, um, you know, prevent this this from you know, leading to, uh, to a, you know, a Chinese Communist Party, for example, with hypersonic weapons who thinks that they can, thinks that they can um, intimidate us or or accomplish their objectives uh, through the use of force. So, uh, you know, we're, we are entering an era of, of new capabilities in space and in cyberspace and with hypersonics, and we have to keep up with it. But I don't think we need to panic. I think what we should worry more about maybe is the proliferation of a lot of these capabilities, uh, especially the most destructive weapons on Earth, for example, to North Korea uh, or to Iran. And I think, I think that's uh, and then potentially uh, these weapons to non-state actors. So HR, I want to ask you on this one: Is, is the danger <clears throat> hypersonics in space, or is the danger a swarm of uh, UAVs, and that our only option is to shoot them down with three million dollar missiles each one? Yeah. Uh, yep. If right. we're going to have a big space, so I'm very struck by, you know, our, our usual industrial policy question. Uh, NASA's heavily lift rocket is what have they spent ten billion dollars and gotten nowhere? Uh, SpaceX, and it turns out, is the ones who've, who've made the rockets for us. So it is really a, uh, a very high dollar investment in fancy stuff going into space, which after all, any large war fought against a power like that in the shadow of nuclear weapons 
is always going to be to some extent limited. Is that really where the uh, the issue lies, or is it the swarms of drones and the cyber attacks, which is where the uh, the fight over Taiwan is going to be uh, uh, is going to be settled? You know, I, I think it's both, right? So for continental defense, I mean, the problem with a with a hypersonic missile is the speed that they they move and, and the maneuverability and so forth, and the inability to use conventional missile defense, right? You can't mm. you can't shoot down the arrows unless you unless you attack these missiles in the boost phase, right? Before they hit the glide and get to you know Mach six or whatever, you know. So so you you I, so the the approach to missile defense has to be different. There are there are solutions to that. Uh, but but uh, but none of those will be perfect. But we never had a perfect you know missile defense to begin with, really, especially in connection with the threat from Russia, because that's where you have a cruise missile threat that could come over the polar ice cap, for example. So so it is not a wholly new situation that we would be in with China with these capabilities. But I think what we want to do is is look for defensive solutions that you said are not so exquisite that we price ourselves out of them. On, on UAS, for example, there are a lot of technological solutions to that. I mean, there are all sorts of, of laser-based air defense capabilities, for example, that work very well against low, slow, and small UAS swarms. But, but the, the development of those, have, we've gotten behind, right? Because we assume for a long time, hey, we're the United States, right? We have a great Air Force, which we do. I never had to look up my entire 34-year career in the Army and say, well, is that, is that enemy or friendly? It was always going to be friendly, right? Because of, our, of the amazing Air Force we have and, and naval aviation and so forth. So, but we got we got complacent, right? And we and we forgot that that our 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 rivals were developing countermeasures to to our to our conventional capabilities. And and now we're catching up. And I think we are catching up. Okay. It is now that time in the show where we go to the one thing that makes John Cochran grimace. And that is the speed round of questions. So, John, bear with us. This will be quick. It'll be, be painless, I promise. So, uh, just yes, no answers, gentlemen. Beginning with a question from Caden, uh, Texas. He has two questions, actually. Hello, good fellows. I'm a big fan of the show. My question to you is, do you think we've heard the last of the, claim, of the claimed election fraud in the 2020 presidential election? And a second question, if Trump plans to run again, will continuing to declare fraud hurt him? No, no and yes. No and yes. John? Uh, I think we will... Uh continue to hear uh, analysis of what happened in 2016 and 2020, but it won't be an important political issue. Uh, and I am very worried that the next few elections will be lots and lots of what we're going to go down this thing about wrangling about every vote. You just don't like yes or no, do you? No, I don't. I, we, a yes and a no without an explanation and without logic and fact behind it is pointless. HR? I'll say no and yes also. And I think it's just incumbent on all of us, you know, all of our listeners, everybody, to to help get 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 us back to facts so we can counter this disinformation. And 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 rec- I think we all recognize how how damaging this 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 disinformation is to our democracy, our confidence, our democratic institutions and processes. And I think we all have a role in it. Okay. Question from Jeremy in Beckenham, England. Is the European Union doomed? Yes or no? <laughs> no. 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 Okay, three no's. Question from, uh, let me add to that, a year from now, will there be a President Macron? Yes or no? No. No. You can't forecast stuff like that. Come on, guys. I'll say yes. I'll say yes. Okay, a yes and no and a abstain. (laughs) (laughs) Two questions from Chris in Singapore. Question one, do you think that China has become economically, politically, and militarily unpredictable? Second question, has China become too opaque for the rest of the world to be able to understand what is truly going on? No, it's not unpredictable. Uh, yes, it's got much harder. Every country is unpredictable and opaque. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, what about economic? I would, say, I would say no, no, and yes. Right. No um, yes. Okay. Three questions from Michael in San Francisco. John, these are up your alley. Question one, is there a sovereign debt bubble, yes or no? Two, as sovereign debt becomes more expensive, will government spending be reduced? And question three, will increased inflation be the government solution to devaluing the debt? So let's take it through the group here. Number one, is there a sovereign debt bubble, yes or no? No. I don't like the word bubble, but I think we are in danger of a sovereign debt, uh, a global sovereign debt crisis, much more than people uh, say. Okay. Neil? No, it's not a bubble. That that it doesn't meet the criteria that define a bubble. Okay. HR. What are those by the way? Well, I'm, I'm not an economist, so I'll just, I would just, if this it was said, an exam, I would just, I would just fill in C. 
you know, and, and hope that I guessed right. So I'll, I'll stay out of this one. Price, price rallies by, say, 5x for no apparent reason. Okay. The second question, will government spending be reduced? Yes or no? But you said when, when it, if interest rates if, rise. If, will sovereign, if sovereign debt becomes more expensive, will government spending be reduced? Yes or no? Well, actually, that that's a curious question. The, an, the answer would be no, because that would imply that r- rates went down. Mm-hmm. If rates but, went up, if if the price of bonds fell and rates went up, then maybe. Okay, John. I think that was the question. If if interest rates rise, will governments respond by uh, cutting back spending uh, or possibly raising tax revenues if, if they can? And then this is a budget constraint question. <laughs> so yes. if if the interest costs on the debt rise, you either cut back in order to pay those interest costs on the debt, or you inflate, or you default. You got those three choices. <laughs> the rest okay, is and where, where it's going to hit, I would just say where it's going to hit is the non-discretionary part of the budget, and uh, and that's that could be profoundly damaging to defense, for example. And then uh, Michael's third question, John, was: Will increased inflation be the government's solution to devaluing the debt? Uh, well, yes, you got no. your choice: <laughs> raise taxes, cut spending, and reform stuff, uh, default explicitly, or inflate. Uh, we just had um, a grand total of about 8% uh, inflation. So we just effectively defaulted on 8% of the debt. So we, we, but we a just lot made that of, just a lot of the government's liabilities are index linked and inflation does not get rid of them. Larry Kotlikoff has made this point for many no, years. No. And so the official debt isn't index linked, yeah, but you right. can't you, exactly, you cannot inflate your way out of Social Security and Medicare. In fact, the debt is not our problem. I just want to, I'm sorry, Neil, I jumped in. The debt is not our problem. Our problem is all our promises of spending in the future way in excess of tax revenues, and all of those are real. Inflation will not solve the, the, the looming debt problems of the U.S. Amen. Okay, and final yes, no question. HRS gets you back in the game. Uh, from Florin in Romania, who writes, given the recent set of unacceptable Russian conditions, or dare I say ultimatum towards the U.S. and NATO allies, realistically speaking, is there any way to get Russia to de-escalate without offering catastrophic concessions in return? Yes or no? Yes. And, and I think that is all about deterrence broadly defined, including the military component. And I'll just say, I love Romania. I was an exchange student there as a senior in high school uh, for a period under Ceausescu. And, and, but my, and my favorite place in Romania is, is Sibiu. Okay. Neil, yes or no? I can't match that. I agree with HR. There is a way of deterring Russia. But the Biden administration's threat of sanctions is not it. Okay, and John, uh, threat threatening sanctions, uh, which have worked so wonderfully in, say, Cuba and Iran, uh, and announcing ahead of time that military response is off the table. Those don't sound like effective ways of uh, of deterring. John, that's it for the yes/no questions. Is that better or worse than getting your shots? <laughs> Just I, say I yes. Still re- I refuse <laughs> yes to or no. yes no, and I, st- I kept to my refusal. <laughs> okay, we have just a couple of minutes left here, guys, but I want to ask you two final questions here. The first one, Neil, it comes from a, uh, a countryman of yours. It's Stephen in Dundee, Scotland. This is all three of you. He writes, if you could speak to your younger self to give them one piece of advice, something you wish you had, had uh, done or known back uh, then, what would it have been? Don't give up mathematics. Uh, which I had to do in order to choose my A-levels. Keep doing mathematics, whatever it takes. That's the one big mistake I made at the age of 16. HR? I would just say don't don't worry about the, maybe the current job that you're in sometimes if you don't like it that much because it's going to change. And don't feel like you have to map out your career well in advance, right? I mean, everything that I, I thought that I would do, uh, it, what units I would go to, what branch I was going to be in the army, all, all that didn't turn out to be the case and it worked out okay. And I wouldn't have changed a thing in retrospect. And what would older but youthful in appearance John Cochran tell younger John Cochran? More I Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, put more in stocks. Uh, be, uh, be, be more patient. Uh, take, take a slightly longer view of things. Uh, savor Savor those moments, especially while your children are young. I thought you were going to say, give shorter answers, John. (laughs) (laughs) Yes or no. Give better thought out answers. uh, 
Okay, gentlemen, finally, mercifully, you might be thinking the last question of our mailbag, and thank you for playing along with me today. This comes from Lee in Georgetown, and he wrote the following, or she wrote the following, and I kid you not, this is what the actual note says, quote, the show is simply the best media product in existence. My greatest worry is that you four will find other things to divert your attention and abandon us. How is the show funded? What can your fans do to support continuation of Goodfellows in perpetuity? When I watch the four of you, I feel like a 15-year-old watching an early Beatles concert. I get all giddy inside. Lee adds, quote, I too love a good Scotch single malt, but I also like Pink Floyd. Deal with it. So, gentlemen, if we are the if we are the Fab Four, I'm going to claim Ringo because Ringo was a drummer. I'm a moderator. It means basically we're timekeepers. Besides, like Ringo, I have very little vocal range. So I'll let the three of you decide who's John, who's Paul, and who's George. That's a great question. I... I've always identified, rightly or wrongly, with John Lennon. When I was a, a young Beatles fan, he was the he was the Beatle I found most appealing, and I still remember the day the news of his death came over the radio and how I I wept. Yeah. So I'd I'd always I'd always have to line up with 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 John if we were going to form a Fab Four, but. I don't think this is a parody question from Andrew Roberts, actually. I don't believe this is. I think we're being set up here. I know that because Andrew Roberts is a Beatles fan, and that's the giveaway here. Lee, uh, if you are really Andrew Roberts, I am on to you. <laughs> All right, H.R. John, if you're in the, who do you want to be? Well, the, 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 there was the Beatles question where yes. I, I was a Paul fan. I hate, hate to admit it. but There you um, go. Right. Uh, but, uh, but as, as I, I, I play the guitar in my, uh, as one of my hobbies and I, I have come to admire what George knew how to do with that, but let's, the question was about our show. Yes. And, uh, and how is it show, funded? I, I would I, like I, to know how our show funded. is funded by the Hoover Institution <laughs> and institutions matter. And this show would not happen without, um, Bill and, and the, and Scott and Shauna and, and Chris and the people behind the scenes. Uh, we just show up and spout off. Uh, so, I, you know, the institutional support is really important for uh, what we do. You just stole uh, HR's thunder. <laughs> HR? I don't know. Well, I mean, George, that was just, just, that, we that just was... to call you. George? George. <laughs> I guess, first of all, you're Paul by Maybe. the I guess that's what I'm left with. I'm, that's what I'm left with. That's, that's true. Okay. I monopolize that's things, okay. and then you come in. HR comes in with this beautiful little riff every now and then. I think we got our roles here. <laughs> I, I started to watch the documentary get back, you know, but it, it was just too, it was just too long. It was like six hours, you know, and, uh, and it was, it was neat to see them all kind of just jamming and going back to some of their early stuff together and, and composing together. But it, it was, uh, it was too much to take for six hours, but if you haven't seen it, it's kind of neat watching the, you know, you're watching the Beatles together in, in just sort of a long format discussion and jam session. It's worth it's, it for that moment when the policeman arrives and tells them they have to stop playing on the roof, roof of the right. studio. I'm terribly sorry, sir. I don't care if you're the Beatles or the Rolling Stones. You're going to have to stop playing. <laughs> Wonderful moment. I know, by the way, there's a very clever episode of The Simpsons where um, Homer Simpson gets in a barbershop quartet and the four of them have a reunion on top of a rooftop. And George Harrison does a cameo on the show and he comes by in a limousine and the window comes down. He pokes his head out and he goes, it's been done. <laughs> Well, yes, Fab Four has definitely been done. I love the fact that a, a, a listener could draw such a comparison. We are not worthy of our listeners. That's clear. I would just like to add, I'm very proud of the three of you because nobody took the low road and said, if you want to send money to Goodfellows, send it to the following P.O. box in Palo Alto, California. <laughs> Okay, well, guys, thanks a lot for uh, doing viewer questions. And again, thank you, uh, all of you who took the time to write into us. You always blow us away with how smart your questions are. And again, if I didn't get to your question today, we apologize. But we think we're going to probably do this more regularly because I think despite John's grumpiness on the yes, no questions, uh, we do enjoy doing this. So as always, thanks for watching and uh, take care, stay healthy, and we will see you soon. So long. If you enjoyed this show and are interested in watching more content featuring H.R. McMaster, watch Battlegrounds, also available at hoover.org.